Let me be clear about something I believe in. A free press is absolutely critical to the success of a democratic republic, such as the United States. My country, but more importantly, our country. The ability for the general public to access unbiased information is critical to democracy. An electorate that is informed is critical to building a government that works for everyone. That is why I believe in journalistic institutions such as National Public Radio, NPR, and Michigan Radio. And sadly, I should also note, a politician that undercuts your right to vote or attempts to delegitimize the press is not your friend. That politician wants to benefit from the system for himself. He has no interest in your well-being. Today, my guest is Lester Graham. He represents the public service that is Michigan Radio. He's a reporter skilled at distilling complex stories to 45 second segments and asking tough questions to arrive at the core of any issue. Long form, short form, you name it, Lester's done it. And he does it damn well. It was my privilege to welcome Lester as the first guest I interviewed after the start of the pandemic. We conducted our conversation in a studio wearing masks most of the time and sitting a full six feet apart. Thank you, GR Studio. Forgoing our normal process of filming inside a restaurant was sad to me. We did, however, still manage some delicious food from local restaurants in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Carvers and Fish Lads, I'm looking at you. Take a look at this, a main lobster roll with house cut fries. Did we deserve a lobster roll this damn good in the middle of Michigan? No, we did not. But Fish Lads crushed it. With a touch of mayo and a hint of chive, this roll knew no bounds. Even though Lester and I were studio bound, we dined well. Somehow we managed a spread based on curbside pickup that was well beyond our expectations. Now, let's get to a discussion about the press, about Lester, and about fine cocktails. I'm Jay Mays, and this is Seared. Amazing food, remarkable people. So I have to say, this is the first um, of our nine or so interviews that I've actually been nervous for. <laughs> Why? Why? I don't know. I've had butterflies like for the past half an hour. I had to like take a walk and do some breathing. Oh, really? Yeah. So I think it's because I've heard your name since... Uh, 2001, when I started listening to NPR, you know, I've just known Lester Graham, and here is Lester Graham. So I wanted to thank you for appearing on Sears. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I think the best place to start, in spite or despite or along with the, the nerves I'm having, is probably on your relationship with cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> now, what do you mean by that? <laughs> Not a personal relationship, <laughs> but your professional relationship with the cocktails. So you're an author of a cocktail book. Co-author, uh, yes. Co-author. Yeah. With, my, with my friend Tammy Coxon. Tammy yeah. Coxon. And you also, that, that book was developed off of the show right. um, that you did on Fridays called uh, Cheers by the same name. Yep. Um, so tell us a little bit about that. I think it's fascinating. Well, T Tammy and I have known each other for a really long time. And um, she's the kind of person who really studies something, really wants to learn it. And so she's been a foodie for a very long time mm. and wanted to find out more about cocktails. And she found out more about cocktails. And then she's like, I've got all this knowledge. What am I going to do? So we're walking down the street in Ann Arbor and she's talking about different alternatives and she's mm -hmm. going to be a secret shopper for the, the what basically was the very first cocktail bar in Ann Arbor, Ravens right. Club. Yep. And uh, I said, well, why don't you pitch your idea of some specialty classes for people mm -hmm. to him while you're there? See what he says. And so she did. And they said, 
we're closed on Monday. <laughs> so yeah, you can do that. We'll sure. make some kind of financial arrangement. And so that was the beginning of uh, what, what um, has become Tammy Tasting's cocktail classes. Sure. Um, when I became the co-host on Stateside, yep. um, she had heard about a public radio show in uh, Cincinnati uh, that dealt with cocktails. And she said, why don't you give a listen to it? So I did. It was horrible. <laughs> if we do something, sure. A, it's got to be short. Yep. B, you have to mix the drink. Yep. And we have to taste it, and I get to critique it. Yeah. You know? And so uh, she said, we can do that. We can figure that out. Yeah. And I went to my boss, Zoe Clark, and she's like, I love the idea. I've got one condition. You've got to use Michigan products. Oof. Which gave us the focus that we really needed, yeah. right? Uh, because the distilling companies were popping up like crazy. Uh, I'd already done some stories about the industry because right. it was growing and the laws had changed so that right. the industry could grow. And so I had some contacts. Tammy had a lot of contacts. And mm -hmm. uh, we started doing them out of our kitchen. And then we started visiting bars. And then we started visiting distilleries. And mm. we really you know, had a couple of years worth of these episodes. And mm. I went to her and said, would I make a book? And she was like, really? Out of radio? Like, It'll take a little work. <laughs> Broadcast writing is one thing. That's fair. Sure. Writing for you know online and then writing for a book, different. Uh, and we thought, well, we're not going to do this if it ends up being a self-published thing. We really right. we need a real publisher. Yeah. So we pitched it to the University of Michigan Press, and to our great surprise, they immediately took it up. And they said, were excited. Here's what we want. Did it open more doors in terms of? I assume cheers on the radio opened doors to the people you needed access to for the book. Right. I mean, after it was on for, it takes everything on radio about a year or two before people catch on. Yeah. And uh, because of the people we were interviewing and mm -hmm. because we were serious about, you know, these things, I mean, when Tammy goes into something, she goes in all the way mm. and she really quickly became... Uh, her own expert on hmm. uh, the cocktail movement, and uh, she was visiting bars in New York and LA and uh, okay. in London, and and you know, questioning these bartenders, these right. mixologists, yes. and uh, basically um, learning as she went, and uh, and so that credibility came through mm. in the shows. Mm -hmm. and it was really clear that we we had something here. And once the mixologists started talking about us in the U.S. Bartenders Guild. Mm got friendly with Tammy and, yep. and invited me to join. I still haven't done that. I need to. Um, where do we went from there? Yeah. And we took them seriously. Yeah. We think they're, That's huge. they're alchemists and artists. Yeah. It seems to me like with Cheers, it, it kind of was a slow burn to begin with, and then it kind of took off yeah. quickly. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, I mean, like I said, everything on radio takes away, unless it's just, you know, like This American Life, which sure. took off just from, it was like a rocket. Hits. Pulse uh, of the nation. Whatever. But but if you're on for four minutes, yeah. one, once every other week, yeah. you're, it, people are not going to, it's going to take a while before people notice. Yeah. And and that's part of what that was. And part of what was that was, was who are these characters on the radio acting like <laughs> they know something about cocktails? I think it would have been easy to be lazy about it. You know, just have a, a guest on for four minutes and they know cocktails. And But you guys really got passionate about it, had a focus and went out into the field to do the work. Oh yeah, absolutely. Found out who, who are the, you know, who are the really good ones, who are the ones who are doing exceptional things. Plus we yeah. used a, a kind of an artifice at first. We were pegging it to a news event. Yeah. You know, so when the state of Michigan was talking about going increasing the speed limit to 75, mm -hmm. we did a thing on the French 75. The French life, sure. But we used Michigan yeah. ingredients, yeah. right? So that really helped. Yeah. And uh, uh, and I think it was that idea that uh, like long road distillers who've become friends of ours, yeah. uh, we started using their product occasionally, different products. Yeah. And and so when we tweet, we you know include them in it and they're like, What's going on here? What's happening? <laughs> Why are we being tweeted at by MPR? Yeah. yeah, and so you know, a lot of the distillers have, have come to know us, and a lot of the bartenders have come to know us, and you know, we're not. You can't go into a bar in Michigan and say, "Hey, have you heard Cheers?" Because they won't know what you're talking about. Sure, but some of the bartenders will. Yeah. So, I was reading the book last night, and I thought it was brilliant to start out with. Michigan's history in terms of alcohol? Right, and that was not our idea. That was the publisher's idea. And okay. It was also, I think, a really brilliant movement. And part of the reporting I'd done 
on the distilling movement. Yeah. Uh, that was stuff I had done already for gotcha. Michigan Radio. Yep. The other stuff, the post uh, prohibition and post prohibition mm -hmm. stuff, um, that was all research that Tammy and I did okay. uh, for the book specifically. Right. And it was fascinating. Uh, I'm a history buff anyway. And, yeah. and to dig into that a little bit was a lot of fun. I know what blew my mind in terms of the prohibition area, but were there some facts that you learned that were just like, I, I, I had no idea Michigan was involved in this way. Um, I, the Avenue de Booze uh, was <laughs> funny to me. Yeah. Uh, I also, uh, we both kind of found this editorial in the New York Times yeah. uh, at the same time of some New Yorker who moved to Detroit and said, you know, uh, when you're new to Detroit, they'll introduce you to their bootlegger like they would their lawyer or right. their barber. Or their doctor, and, yeah. And that was a, that was a, that was a that was a treasure finding yeah. that little editorial, and we both kind of found it at the same time. Right, so it was a, that's a good part of it. And then you know another thing that uh, I thought was really funny is I always knew that NASCAR right. came out of bootlegs uh, bootleggers you know, yeah. out of the South, but uh, the speedboat industry right really took off yeah Michigan boats. Uh, during the Prohibition because the boat makers were like selling to the bootleggers and the cops would come to them and say, we need something fast enough to catch up with the bootleggers and they'd make them for them. Right. And then the bootleggers would say, we need something faster because the cops are catching up with us. Double and, dipping. Yeah, so yeah, they were they were playing both sides of the, of the <sighs> issue. So. It's, a, it's a classic story, I think. To me, something that stood out was the, the fact that Michigan uh, was the first to ratify the um, going back to alcohol and eliminating prohibition because of this movement. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, and it, first of all, most of the politicians publicly might say they were in favor of it, but most of them were still visiting speakeasies and sure. so forth. Um, the 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 sieve across from Canada to yes. Michigan. I mean, there was no way you're keeping Canadian whiskey and you know stuff imported from Europe through right. Canada. Uh, out of uh, out of Michigan because it was just so profitable, mm. and um, you know some of the bathtub gin that was going around was mm -hmm. just just horrible. Of course, it did you know it also ruined cocktails for decades, right? Because they were used to using fruit juice and sugar and anything they right. could to get rid of the horrible alcohol <laughs> taste. Yeah, that because home it was so distillery. bad. Yeah. And, uh, and then it, it took a long, long time before we got to this craft cocktail mo movement we're seeing now. Hmm. Yeah, the craft cocktail movement has been not as pervasive as the craft beer movement? No, not yet. Not yet, right. Yeah, it's, it's but steady. It's not as fast as the craft beer movement. Right. The craft beer movement was amazing. Yeah. It was like, it was like the same growth rate as Starbucks when it started <laughs> Insane. out. Insane, yeah. Uh, I, uh, I moved here from Illinois near St. Louis, Missouri. And, yeah. you know, uh, Missouri was slow in the craft beer movement because Anheuser-Busch is based there. Sure, St. And Louis. They, they had a lot of lobbying efforts in Jefferson City, Missouri to mm -hmm. stop uh, the growth of this, this industry. Now, St. Louis is like any other town in the United States. They've got a lot of brew pubs. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one there was uh, by a guy named Tom Schlafly. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he really led that movement to stop uh, Anheuser-Busch from doing that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think the state of Missouri owes him a great debt because mm. he did that. Also, uh, Phyllis Schlafly's nephew, and he was always embarrassed. He didn't want anybody to know that that was his aunt. <laughs> so it kind of, it's like, yeah, we don't, we don't have the same political beliefs. <laughs> Interesting. So do you think, uh, there were also Michigan laws in place that prevented the rise of the craft uh, cocktail industry, Absolutely. Right? or at least uh, through distilling? Yeah, I mean, we, we're still one of the more um, regulated states yeah. uh, in, in the nation. I mean, we don't have state-owned stores. We right. don't have that. No drive-thrus. Like that, <laughs> right. Uh, but, um, the only thing you could distill for the longest time was fruit-based stuff. And, you know, that was great for the vintners, that was sure. great for the apple orchards, yep. you know. In fact, when MSU started doing its distilling training program, mm -hmm. they were operating under the Uncle John's apple orchard. Oh, yeah, yeah, They yeah. had a federal permit for brandy. Yep. And so they were operating uh, uh, under that permit mm. to teach people how to distill. Interesting. And then uh, the guy who was running that program yeah. ended up getting together with a legislator, a couple of legislators, and yep. they got the laws changed so that you could mm. use grain-based, you could use grain to make distilled spirits as well as sure. fruit. 
And that made all the difference. How would you, how, how do you interpret the current distillation industry in Michigan, craft, craft? Alcohol? Still, still growing. Still I mean, growing. I mean, uh, we put a list of all the distillers in That's the right. back of the book. In the back, yeah. And by the time it was published, it was out of date. January 19, yeah, is that from, right? Yeah, it came out in September. We, did, we okay. wrote it in January, it came out in September. Gotcha. And it was already dated. Okay. Uh, because there's so many, so many distillers opening up all over. And they're, they're becoming, I mean, I don't know how many I, precisely there are, but at this point, there's a good bit over 60 distillers wow. in the state. Yeah. Um, and you probably have 20, probably half of those in your book? Um, we, Third? we have like 40 in there, I think. Oh, okay, more than yeah, two thirds. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> my, um, my personal favorites have been uh, Iron, Iron Fish and Traverse City Distillery and Long Road. Long Road is fantastic. I think Eastern Kill in Grand Rapids, which used to be, oh, I'm blanking on their name. It was funny, we were just over there not too long ago, and he yeah. kept calling it the old name. The old name? Yeah. yeah. I have some of their yeah. old bottles. Um, do you know who I'm talking about? Grace Guys. Grace Guys. Thank Grace you guys. so much. Yeah. Do you know why I stopped calling it Grace Guys? Is it because of the vodka? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. That's the, unfortunate. The vodka that will remain unnamed, <laughs> unidentified. The vodka that will remain unnamed. Yes. <clears throat> well, I thought the book was fascinating. We'll link to it um, and tell everybody about it, but it's called Cheers and it's all about Michigan cocktails. And I, I thought it was, uh, when I read the book, I could tell it was a labor of love. Um, like there was a ton of research in it, but then there was also this level of expertise, like the, the accessible expertise in the book. Yeah, and she's really good at that. Tammy Coxon is really good at that. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, she also was responsible for a lot of the history uh, in the drinks, because yeah. the, there's not just history about Michigan and yeah. booze, yeah. but there's history behind the drinks, which yes. I think is really, really great too. So yeah. it's not your typical cocktail res recipe book. Yeah. Um, it's also gorgeous. Um, like some of the photos are fantastic. Thanks. And I noted that you were the cover photographer. Yes. I, I did all the photo. You almost did all, all the photos. All of it, 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 unless otherwise noted, it was my photo. Yeah. Uh, which is which is you know I'm a hobbyist photographer and I started getting more serious. In fact, about midway through those episodes, I started getting more serious about it yeah. and getting better equipment. So some of the photographs they put in there, I was like cringing a little bit, <laughs> but. Uh, I got better as it went on. It's funny. I, I like touring um, beer pub, brew pubs and um, any cocktail bars as much as possible. That's my favorite thing to do in a city. I think it's a good way to get to know people and a good way to get to know the city. But in the book, I recognize like four or five of the bartenders that you have pictures of. And it's like, <laughs> oh, my God. I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> but it was fun. To Depends see. on how much you drink when you're there. <laughs> I guess that's true. That's the thing. I guess yeah. that's true. Uh, well, yeah, Cheers was fantastic. So I wanted to start there because I thought it was, uh, I thought it was relevant. Yeah, it's, it's fun. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Cheers to Michigan. A celebration of cocktail culture and craft distillers. Could there be a better title for what amounts to a love note to the creators of the components of this class of libation? The growers, the distillers, and ultimately, the bartenders. Originally, I bought this book to do some research on Lester. Now, however, I am remarkably glad to own this tome for its recipes and, of course, its many history lessons. Lester and his co-author, Tammy Coxon, truly did an excellent job. If you love craft cocktails, I heartily recommend clicking on the link below. I want to shift gears a little bit to the environmental part, mm -hmm. uh, because that's how I came to know your name. For me, listening to NPR started uh, in 2001. I was siding a garage of a good friend of mine. Uh, Rob Swider, he, we were listening, it was a Saturday, we were listening to Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. Mm -hmm. I was like, what is this channel? <laughs> like, I didn't expect radio, uh, even in 98 to be, or 2001 to be um, sort of my go-to source for news. I just never had really listened to it. It was always music. And so he said, oh, it's NPR, you know, this is just the weekend show, it's more entertainment, but during the week it's news. And I started listening to it on my commute, I started listening to it every single day. And the environment- It, it can be addictive. It, it is addictive. It's, well, it's good information, it feels like you're, it feels challenging sometimes, like it challenges your viewpoints, and I think that's important. 
it, it felt like a good source of news for me and a good way to stay in contact with the world. But the environment report ended up being very important to me because my brother was always interested in the environment. He's a fisheries biology now. It was out, I grew up in the woods um, on 20 acres. The environment was uh, pervasive. So someone who is actually going out and looking for stories of people either doing good things with the environment, violating the environment in some way, or just telling how nature is changing and how we're impacting it um, was hugely impactful to me. So I want to thank you for that. Thank but that's, <laughs> that's how I got into, that really kept me glued to MBR for a very long time. And that's how I came to know your name. So I'd like to know personally the history of the Environment Report and its current manifestation too. Well, it started out uh, actually at, at Michigan State University mm -hmm. uh, and uh, a guy named David Hammond and John Hoban mm -hmm. uh, were working on it. And then their general manager who came up with the idea said, all right, guys, I'm going to the University of Michigan's station. Mm -hmm. Why don't we just bring the whole operation over there too? Yeah. And they did. And they were there about a year and uh, they had like 34 public radio stations picking up their stories, mm -hmm. which is, you know, pretty nice. Right. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I uh, was asked to leave my uh, previous station. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a long, long story. <laughs> there were lots of uh, trade magazine articles about it. I was not the bad guy, I will tell you. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and thankfully, the trade magazines all picked up on that. Good, um, good. So anyway. Uh, a friend I'd worked with uh, was at Michigan Radio yeah. and said, look, he's done a lot of coverage of environment just through his uh, normal reporting duties. Yeah. And I had. It had always been a, a, an issue for me. Yeah, uh, I didn't think that news media in general were covering the environment enough. Absolutely. And so I was doing, uh, I was doing a lot of it uh, for a long time Absolutely. prior to that. And so th um, we talked and it seemed like a good fit for both of us. Uh, mm -hmm. They did want me to stay in Chicago or mm -hmm. go to Chicago and be the reporter there. And like, you guys really need mm -hmm. a reporter who travel the entire region because yeah. right now you're kind of relying on local reporters all the time. Right. And uh, they agreed with that. Um, actually, they didn't agree with it at <laughs> first. <laughs> like, oh, well, that's not the job. I'm like, well, too bad because if it were, I'd be interested. Right. And two days later, they said, we want to fly you up and talk to you about this job you've created for yourself. <laughs> Great, score. You had the right sense. Yeah, and it turned out really well. Uh, and that was the Great Lakes Radio Consortium. Okay. Um, uh, and we went from and two years from 34 stations to more than 70. Wow. Uh, and then um, editors left, and suddenly my friend uh, Mark Brush and I uh, the late Mark Brush and I were running it, mm -hmm. and um, Rebecca Williams was always a part of that from the beginning. Yeah, and so we're trying to expand it more. Soon we're over a hundred stations, and we're noticing some of them are in Tennessee wow. and in Georgia yeah. and places like that. We're going, what is going on here? And we realized. While our stories are about the environment in the Great Lakes, right. a lot of these environment stories could be told anywhere. Sure. And so people were picking it up. And so we decided, let's stop pretending that we're a regional. Let's go ahead and just become uh, a, an environmental service for the entire nation. Mm -hmm. And so the general manager said, well, let's get some guys in to help guide us to that. Mm -hmm. So they hired Jim Russell, who's responsible for a thing called Morning Edition <laughs> and Marketplace. Right, just small little shows. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and so he helped out. Uh, and then we needed a guy to come and get um, uh, money for us, help us find money yeah. at the national level. Because yeah. we're, we're subsisting on grants right. at this point. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that, one of the rules of Michigan Radio is you're not supposed to take any money from the general budget. Right. Uh, you're supposed to survive on your own. Mm. And so that, that was the plan, and we're going to need more money to do this, right? Uh, and that guy, some experience too, he, he did things for this old house and Bill Nye, the science guy, so he had some connections. Again, small little shows. <clears throat> so we're up and going, we're national. Uh, it's growing yeah. all the time, uh, and we got up to 160 stations and a couple of key stations that were very important for public radio because they're watched, KUT in mm -hmm. Austin and KUOW in Seattle. Mm -hmm. uh, they were both testing it out 
marketing it a little bit, see what they see whether they wanted to keep it on or not. Big markets. Yeah, yeah. Well, we were already in um, That's true. Washington. Yeah. Uh, one of the New York stations, one of the smaller New York City stations, had us on. Okay. Uh, but we were on in St. Louis and, and you know, I mean, across the Midwest, a lot of the South, and some of these Northeast corridor, and, and uh, we had a few stations in. Uh, Washington, Oregon, hmm. and California as well. So we we were we were coast to coast. Yeah, we needed a lot more to, to you know than sure. 160. You know, at least 200 is like the minimum number you want for a national okay. dis nationally distributed show. But we're on our way. Yeah. We're really positive about it, uh, getting there. And then the recession hits. Yep. And the grants started drying up. And hmm. they came to us and said, "Look, we've got this corporate sponsor." Um, and uh, they want to be exclusive, but they only want to give you half the money you're talking about. And we're like, ah, oh, man, we don't want to limp along. Mm -hmm. We've got enough money through the end of the year to do it exactly the way we want to. Yep. And so we'd rather go out strong than try to limp along, so we turned that offer down. It was the best decision in our lives, because that no offer... Kidding was from uh, BP, Yep. Oh, and three months later, BP had a little accident in the Gulf of Mexico. Sure. Can you imagine trying to get stations to pick up an environment show, yep. environment news, sponsored by BP right. at that moment? Mm -hmm. It would have ruined our careers. Yeah. We would have been done. Yeah. We would have finished. So we wow. made the right choice for the right reasons, yeah. which is you know the nice thing about it. So anyway, um, so we entered the, the national version of the Environment Report. Uh, the station, uh, uh, you know, while we had a lot of contract reporters, we had to let go. And I really, to this day, feel bad about that. But it was you know, kind of out of our hands. Yeah. Um, the station decided to keep Mark and Rebecca and me on. They assigned me to be an investigative reporter. Yeah. Mark started really bolstering our websites. Mm -hmm. And Rebecca was doing a Michigan version of the Environment Report. Right. And did for eight years afterwards. Okay. Uh, so this, so the Environment Report proper, um, the nationally syndicated show, ended in uh, 2010, is that right? I, let's see, I've got to think. Or nine? Um, that sounds right. Okay. I, I don't remember exactly. Um, but you ended on a high. I, I was, yeah, I was there, I was, I was with him for 12 years. Okay. Okay. So 12 to, from 98, I guess that'd be 2010. Yeah. yeah. So you ended on a high note, and then it sort of branched off into different, um, it evolved into the right. local it Michigan became, Instead of a daily national show, yeah. it became a twice a week Michigan radio only yeah. show. I, well, Interlock and, and Traverse City also sure. picked it up. Yep. Uh, so we were, we were on uh, those stations. Mm -hmm. Rebecca did a fantastic job. Um, in fact, it was a lot of work trying to put out two shows by herself, yeah. essentially. Uh, that, was, that was a phenomenal effort. Mm. And then um, I'm off doing some investigative stuff, some policy stuff out of Lansing, and then the Detroit bankruptcy happened, and I yeah. got involved with the Detroit Journalism Cooperative there, working with... WDET, yep. Detroit Public Television, Bridge Magazine, uh, which was a great experience, but it was not the environment. Sure. Um, Do you, so in your investigative reporting after the environment reports, um, have you, I think you, you've blended in some environmental reporting, including PFAS, right? Yeah, well, um, uh, I was actually go, making that transi transition back. Okay. Yeah, we did a lot of stuff. Uh, we did a series on PFAS, okay. uh, uh, won some awards, which was really nice. Yeah. Um, and still need to do some more work on that. I, I will tell you, though, uh, Garrett Ellison mm -hmm. uh, did the best job on that story. I've said it publicly many times, mm -hmm. uh, and I've complimented it every chance I get because nobody covered that story like he did, mm. and he really made a difference. It's mm. like... Uh, Lindsay Smith at Michigan Radio yeah. covering Flint right. during the water crisis. Huge. She made a real difference. Garrett made a real difference with PFAS. So it's there. Are, journalism, journalism counts. Yeah, I mean, some of these people are just driven. Yeah, to dig deeper. Journalism counts. There's this other despicable phrase out there wielded to admonish and diminish any fact or point of view that politician disagrees with. Fake news. 
The phrase is as clever as it is misleading. There's hope. Journalism counts. That confusion about what to believe is exactly why we need high quality journalism, now and always. There are still journalists throughout this country that are seeking the truth every single day. But what's their aim? Why are they doing it? The unbiased production and distribution of reports on current or past events based on facts and supported with proof and evidence. Lester is one of those journalists. I'd rather think of a story that nobody else is doing at all Yeah, and try to do that story. Bring that to the light. Well, shining light on something that people don't know about <clears throat> is a different mission than digging into something that people have to And know. it takes a different character. It takes, yeah, yeah, for sure. Different personality. What were some of your um, most interesting or favorite or most impactful stories from the Environment Report that just resonated with you personally? One that we did that I was really pleased with, uh, we did a thing on, uh, on uh, lead abatement, yep. lead paint, yep. things like that. And um, we got a note from somebody who had influence with the governor, mm -hmm. and he said, I'm gonna to talk to the governor about that. Mm. And then suddenly there was a $500,000 increase in the state budget for wow. lead abatement. Wow. Half a million dollars isn't gonna go that far sure. for lead abatement, but it was, it was like, oh wow, we did that. People Another one uh, I did that was I thought was really great, uh, and I got, this, I got this letter from a state representative. Uh, I'd done a series on asthma yep. and how pollution in certain areas and increases the asthma, especially for African-American kids. Huh. And so um, I really, really dug into it. Yeah. Really researched that one, make yeah. sure I had all the uh, uh, I's dotted and T's crossed. And um, she sent me a note thanking me for the series and said, I was sitting in my car late for a committee meeting but I had and uh, listened to the rest of one of those episodes, mm -hmm. and I got out of my car, and my Republican colleague was also getting out of his car, and I, she said, "You're late too." He said, "Yeah, I was listening. It's fascinating thing about <laughs> asthma and kids." Right. And I thought, "Wow, you know, you don't know what kind of a difference you make." Yeah, that's sometimes. a great point. And and those two were concerned enough about the issue to continue to have one of those driveway moments where they're sitting in their cars, yes. they need to be getting out of their cars because they've got a meeting to get to, right. but instead they're listening to this piece because they know it's an important piece of journalism. So it's those kind of stories that really make me happy because that means you're hitting the right buttons with policymakers to actually make a difference. What do you consider yourself in? Just a reporter, drop the investigative, or? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a reporter. Right now I'm an environment reporter. Well, actually now I'm a COVID-19 reporter. You know, that's because I, yeah. I got reassigned for a while because sure. of this pandemic, and, yeah. and rightfully so. Uh, I'll be glad to get back. I'll be glad when things are safe enough that we can actually get back to yeah. doing uh, the environment report because it's important. It's an important yeah. beat that needs to be covered. Yeah. Are you still doing Cheers? Yeah. Um, we have it for we have it for six weeks. Okay. Uh, because we're still trying to figure out how do you do a Cheers episode remotely. Uh, <laughs> it's and tougher. you know, basically, it's going to come down to she's going to say, "All right, we're going to have to mix it together." Yep. My place, uh, I'll mix it or tell you how to mix it. You can mix it at your place. We'll record both ends. Yeah. We'll mix it and yeah. uh, and and do it that way. So. That's the plan. Now we just have to decide when we're going to do it because it's been a little busy uh, sure. at my place lately. So. <laughs> so I think we should probably mention at this point, since um, you mentioned it already, we're sitting so far apart, which is probably visible on camera because we're social distancing. Trying our best. Anyway. Trying our best. I, yeah, I, we you know, at, at this point, and I'll, I'll be frank and I know it, uh, we're going to get yelled at because we don't have masks on, mm. even though we're six feet apart. Yeah. Uh, because six feet apart with masks would be considered social distancing. Social distancing. Uh, but uh, we both know our uh, we're asymptomatic. Asymptomatic. Which the entire crew is asymptomatic. Not, may not mean anything. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's one thing that but, we're having a hard time with. But, you know, I, I'm walking around, uh, I don't know about you, but I'm walking around in my neighborhood 
uh, walking into stores with masks and gloves on. Me too. And a lot of times the clerks have no mask, no gloves. It's frustrating. The customers have no masks, no gloves. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, it's become a political statement. Right? It has. Um, you don't wear a mask because you believe a certain thing and that's your way of declaring it. And I, I'm thinking, I would love for you to make your statement, call your representative. Send a letter vote. Send a letter. Go, go to the protests. Yeah. Uh, do the things you need to do to make the statement you want to make. Yep. But wear a mask so you keep you and your, fa you and your family safe. Yeah. You know. And in fact, it's not even about you being safe because the mask isn't really it's protecting, protecting you. No. But you may be asymptomatic. Right. And might be carrying it and might be spreading it. And if you're wearing a mask, at least you never have to feel like, oh my gosh, I gave it to somebody. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Or at least the chances are reduced. Some of what you've heard Lester and I discuss so far about the ongoing pandemic may sound slightly outdated. That's because we filmed in May of 2020. So this conversation is a time capsule of sorts for a moment during the pandemic that had even more uncertainty. For, for our show's sake, we've put everyone in PPE. Um, we've put... Um, all of our crew in N95s and uh, valve covers um, with disinfectant masks and hand sanitizer and soap and all those When things. I walked in and saw the case of disinfectant stuff, I thought somebody's been doing a deep clean That's here. Right. That's good. <laughs> yeah. So we were pretty happy with that. But it has been a struggle with, you know, how do we interact with people? But if at any point we feel it's proper to put our masks on, we should. Well, um, uh, I mean, we had this discussion. Yeah. Do we do this sure. with or without? Um, and we are, I, I acknowledge that there is some risk here, mm -hmm. but you're the only risky thing I've done in three months. Same here. So uh, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling fairly safe because yeah. I think we've been doing the right thing until this moment. This is the first time we've uh, filmed since February uh, when we were in the UP. Um, so yeah, and everybody's been very cautious. For my part, um, we've we this will be the first food I've actually eaten from a restaurant. Yeah, yeah. Um, that although we, my wife did some pickup at one of our restaurants. Yeah. She does pickup once in a while. Yeah. And basically, when you do pickup there, you pop your trunk. Yep. They put the food in. Yep. And you pay ahead of time. Yep. You tip ahead of time. Yeah. And they just drop the food in your trunk and you go home. Which I think is, I mean, there's been no, and correct me if I'm wrong, you've studied this more than I have, but there's been no evidence of foodborne transmission. Not yet, no. Uh, although they do say um, uh, that the, probably the best thing to do is throw the cartons away, wash your hands. Yep. And then eat. Yep. Well, that's what we'll do when we get there. I want to talk a little bit about the environment or, or what you're doing right now uh, before we talk about kind of media as a whole in terms of, uh, COVID and what the reporting has been like since the beginning of COVID. I think it's relevant and important. I've been working on uh, the economy for the most part. I mean, mm -hmm. I've been doing a lot of um, what we call spot news. We do feature stories or the ones that are like four to seven minutes long. Yeah. And then spot news are the things you hear in the newscast. They're yeah. like 50 seconds long or something mm -hmm. like that. I've been doing a lot of spot news coverage and across the gamut on COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Almost everything's been COVID-19. Uh, the features I've done have been dealing primarily with the economy. Mm. Um, uh, I know this will air later or be online later, but today's story was about how do the assembly workers at Ford, Chrysler, and GM go back to work right. um, and what protections are they given because a lot of those people are working shoulder to shoulder on some of this stuff yeah. and uh, touching all the same tools. Yep. Uh, and so it, it, that's going to be quite an interesting uh, experiment with a high cost of uh, if it fails. Yeah. Um, and both the UAW and the companies are all watching. If anybody gets sick, you know, the shift may be stopped and deep clean, yep. or they may just shut down a line. May have to. Um, it, don't, it all depends. And that's something they'll have to work out because they don't have a definite threshold set yet. Mm -hmm. So I, I was reading an editorial piece about. Everybody making the decisions on this stuff, you know, are uh, health experts and health officials and policymakers, right. and they're all like still working. Yeah. And you know, um, maybe don't realize the cost, uh, and the real cost comes yeah. when the federal stimulus disappears. When right. those six hundred dollars uh, a week check. 
disappears, if yeah. it does, uh, at the end of June, right. then it gets desperate for the workers. That's true. Uh, and, some of, and some of the you know, gig uh, sector and some of the small business owners. But there are others who, who if you're a physical therapist, how are you ever going to work? Barber. Yeah. Simple. I mean, some of the, in the health field in general, but like you said, these service industry jobs or these gig worker jobs that interact with people. How do you go back to work? How, how am I supposed to go back to uh, the gym, right? Yeah. I mean, everybody's pretty diligent about wiping things down, but now you're going to have to, you know, is this the right wipe? Yeah. Should we be using something else? Yeah. You know, it's, it's tough. Talisker, single malt, scotch whiskey. Bottled in 2013, aged 11 years before that. While our sandwiches and Icelandic cod awaited our first bite, we instead made a brief detour to the Isle of Skye. The distiller's edition of Talisker is double matured in former Amoroso sherry casks, which of course impart a soft fruit flavor into the sippable delight. The hint of smoky peat won't overwhelm your palate, but it may certainly cause you to relax in your favorite armchair. So, cheers. Cheers. Salud. That'll calm my nerves. That's nice. Still a little smoky, but not as smoky as the Lafroig or the right, Ardbeg. Right. This is something my uh, my news director would love. He's pretty well a, a, a neat Scotch guy. Okay. Uh, he's a very disciplined man. He's got several black belts and wow. everything else. But uh, he will have a Scotch once in a while, and uh, that's that's his. Yeah, I think he, I think it's uh, Oban. Oh yeah, Oban. Yeah, I think like Oban a lot. So I had some on the shelf. I almost brought the Oban. <laughs> It'd be wasted on me. <laughs> you know, sometimes I'd be going to a science conference in Buffalo, New York, and I would go to those uh, so I could get a lot of uh, payoff for the flight sure. there. Yeah. And uh, I'd be able to gather material for maybe 35 stories. Yeah. And come back, and I'd have to do some additional reporting, some additional interviews. But then I could crank those out yep. and do a couple of others besides that. And by that time, it's about time to go to another place. Yeah. And so uh, I really felt like I'm actually a reporter. I'm flying places, yep. gathering news, coming yep. back, producing it, putting it on, flying again. And I was, I was out of the house at least one week a month. Mm. And uh, it worked out really well. The kids were at that point just old enough that it wasn't a big disruption for them. Yeah. And uh, and I was seeing things that I, you know, I grew up in Illinois, yeah, but didn't see Lake Michigan until I was like 22, mm -hmm. uh, because I was from river country. Do you fish at all? I did when I was younger. So yeah. I fish and hunt when I was younger. Okay. For a good part of my career, I was a news director, mm -hmm. and you just you've got to, you're on call all the time. Right. You can't get away. Right. Um, you can't be in a blind someplace mm -hmm. or out on a boat someplace. Yeah. You've got to be accessible. Ready to respond. And I kind of got in that mood um, and, you know, I went through all my 20s, my 30s, and into my 40s. And then I, when I got the chance to do that, um, the appeal wasn't there like it was. Sure. I do love to get out in the woods. Yeah. I do love to get out on the water. Yeah. But um, I carry a camera. Yeah. I can't tell you how many cameras I've run in the water. <laughs> do you consider yourself a Michigander at this point? I do. It feels like home. Mm -hmm. I loved Illinois. Mm -hmm. um, but the diversity here, I mean, if you go up to Route 10, yep. you enter a different state. Yep. If you go up past Houghton Hancock, Yep. You're in a different state. Yeah. I mean, the forest changes dramatically. Uh, I don't get up to the UP nearly as much as I do, and I get up there once or twice a year, mm -hmm. uh, or as much as I'd want to. Sure. Um, 
and you know, I'd love to take a photograph of a moose up there. But I'm just about to the point where I'm thinking, if I'm going to get another photograph of a moose, I'm going back to Isle Royale. Yeah. Now. You've so been to Isle Royale? I've been, I've been there once. Oh my God, tell me about that. Well, it was on a journalist trip. Um, there's a thing called the Institute for Natural Resources, mm -hmm. uh, Journalism and Natural Resources. And uh, I got tabbed to go on that. It was a 14-day trip um, packed with talking to wildlife uh, ad, uh, uh, managers and tribal leaders mm. and business people. I mean, we went to see how uh, taganite is mined mm. and how they process it. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw uh, a tribe that was uh, found a way, using the cheapest material possible, to restore the, um, 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 oh God, what is the name of that trout? The one that Hemingway loved. Um, mm. um, looks like a rainbow. Uh, right. I mean, it's not a rainbow trout, but it looks like it looks like a jukebox. Um, I can't remember the trout. The name. cutthroat is a hybrid. That's in Montana. It's not the cutthroat. No, this is native. It's native. And it's very colorful. Brook trout. Brookies. I didn't know you were talking about brookies. My, oh, one of my favorite <clears throat> fishes to fish. Fish to fish. Yeah. Before. Yeah. They found a way to basically, the, you know that perforated pipe they use for sewers? Yeah. They just drove them down into a gravel bed. Yep. And they can, uh, they, they nest there. And mm. they've got really good reproduction rates. You know, the biggest thing on, on brook trout is it's got to be pristine. It's got to yeah. be really clean. And uh, there just aren't enough rivers in this state that are that way. Yeah, the last time I went fishing, which was um, last summer, um, my brother and I went fishing for a brook trout. Fun, good, fun fish to find. You got to go through tag alders or something mm. like that usually. Um, kind of into remote streams and tribs, but yeah, it's a good fish to fish. Amazing food. That phrase is our tagline here at Seared. So of course, even though we filmed in a warehouse studio, it was absolutely required that we enjoy some good eats. The Icelandic Cod from Fish Lads. Let it be known that beer batter is better. The carbonation from a good lager adds a certain lightness to the batter. Pour in some flour, add some salt, and then the Midwest staple known as PBR, Pabst Blue Ribbon. And then you're in for a hearty, satisfying treat. But what is fish without chips? House cut fries? Yeah, thank you. Now I'm ready to continue this conversation. So something you alluded to that I thought was interesting and um, I think would be interesting for our viewers is the production process. Because you said you can take a week, you can go to a conference, you can talk to people, spend the entire week there and come away with three to five stories. You're interviewing people the entire time, you're doing research and all of that. Take us through the production process from that to air. Um, what goes into that? I'm gonna be the process for a story I loved doing um, and uh, turned into a, uh, a great story but um, Anyway, I went to one of these conferences. Yeah. Uh, I believe it was the uh, Congress of, uh, the International Congress for Botanical something or other. These happen once every six years, mm -hmm. so they're rare. And there happened to be one in the Midwest, so I went to it. Yeah. And I particularly wanted to talk to a guy from Rutgers yep. who had been doing uh, what's <clears> called <throat> phytoremediation, mm -hmm. using plants to soak up pollution, mm -hmm. like chemicals, like mercury or something like that, into the plant to recover ground. Thought it was fascinating, thought it was really interesting stuff. Now, yeah. th these many years later, it's a fairly common practice. Yeah. Uh, but I sat in on this other one at the advice of one of the scientists. This guy started talking about uh, some DNA experiments he'd been doing with rice. And he called it golden rice because it added carotene and vitamin A mm. because in cultures where white rice is a staple, uh, there's a problem with blindness. And so adding the vitamin A and the carotene into it, but it made the rice yellow. Sure. And uh, so I did that and I did some follow up on it to find out more. You know, I talked to the Ford Foundation who sponsors this great big rice research facility in the Philippines. No, this is not a Great Lakes story. Yeah. But it's an interesting story because it affects the world, right? Yeah. And what really struck it for me, and this guy was somewhere in Scandinavia. Um, 
he was not holding all any of the patents. He was giving it all up. Wow. So that anybody could use this and, and do the research and, and duplicate it and, mm -hmm. and go on. Now, uh, I did the story and I pitched it for uh, to NPR. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, no, we're not interested in some guy's experiment. Yeah. A year later, Engel Patricus ends up on the cover of Time magazine and NPR is calling me, do you still have tape from that a year later? Yeah. And so I tell people, I, I was the first person in the US to break this story yeah. and they laugh at me. And, and it's like, no, I knew Ingo Patricus before he was on the cover of Time and did a story a year before he was on the cover of Time. Wow. But you go, you get the tape, you do some follow-up. Yep. Uh, and the, 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 the part I find hardest is writing mm -hmm. uh, because you've got all this information and you want to tell everybody everything you learned, right? Yeah. That's the instinct. You sure. Know? And so if you did, you know, you hear nothing but 12-minute stories on the air and that just won't fly with the editors. No. And so you have to say, all right, what, I need to boil this down to the essence. What's the most important thing? Uh, and, and it's hard because I'll have pages and pages of notes. Sure. And lots and lots of, uh, you know, an interview for me usually goes about 20 minutes. Yeah. And I'm going to use two bites out of it that sure. are about 12 seconds long. Yep. And I've got all this great information, this perspective that could be a great other story. Sure. Uh, but you'll probably never get to it because something else will pop up. Right. Do you do the? Do you go into the studio to record the audio? Do you have a setup at home? I have. I have a setup at home, setup which at is home. I always have. Yeah. Uh, since I was started in this uh, business a long, long time ago. Okay. Um, so you got your booth at home that you can go into. It, it's. I wouldn't. Uh, booth is an exaggeration. Uh, <laughs> I've got a little basement office that is was set up when I was there. It's pine wood. Nice. Uh, I. Uh, Got some acoustic tiles, sure. uh, professional acoustic tiles, and stapled them to the ceiling and to some of the wall surfaces, so yep. it, it lowers the bounce a little bit. Uh, I have to make sure that my wife isn't going to be starting something in the laundry, <laughs> and that the kids aren't going to be banging around upstairs. Yep. You know, so it's uh, it's not ideal, uh, but it's you know I, I've been doing it for a long time. Uh, uh, now I have to. Um, That's what I was going to say. It sounds. I mean, I'm not even allowed to go to the station right now. Right. It sounds um, idyllic compared to um, what else you have to deal with right now. You know, you're all set up, ready to go, and you have this quiet space to do it. I'll tell you why it sounds idyllic to me. I have to record these voiceovers, and I was going to a good friend uh, Josh Morgan's studio. That's where I was recording. Last night, to record voiceovers, I went into a walk in closet, mm -hmm. set up the microphone, and recorded in that. Several of my colleagues are doing that right now. Yeah, they're using a walk-in closet because it's closer dampening, sound dampening. Yep, and uh, it, it, it's it's handy, and they didn't have to go to the expense uh, that I did to yeah set up a uh, nice get booth. acoustic uh, tiles and stuff like that. But I, I just there are projects that I love that I've done on my own. Yeah, that I really want um, to be able to do and have the equipment to do. I, I did a documentary on the 1948 presidential race, the whistle stops race between yes. Thomas Dewey and uh, uh, was a, an Owasso native, for right. those who don't know, uh, and Truman, yep. uh, and um, um, uh, the Dixocrat uh, candidate, Strom Thurmond. Wow. I did not know Strom was involved in yeah. that election. It, it, they walked out of the Democratic convention yeah. and started up their own uh, party. Wow. States Rights Party. Yeah. But they just called them the Dixiecrats. The Dixiecrats. So at that time, Strom Thurmond was still alive, and I got a little interview with him, although he was not great. <laughs> uh, Walter Cronkite Happens. was alive yeah. uh, at the time. I was able to interview him because he wow. had a small role in that, in that campaign, very sure. small role. Uh, you know, I talked to um, uh, uh, McCullough, David McCullough, who wrote the Pulitzer <laughs> Prize winning uh, book on Truman. Yep. Uh, and got to do that one in person. That was nice. Uh, and, and I had a friend who was helping me with that named uh, Matthew Algio, who's since become a historian mm. and has written several great books. Um, and he was working the Dewey side of the equation. Sure. And so uh, we found a lot of archive stuff. Wow. Really good. We found some reporters who were there then and still alive today. Yeah. Uh, so we could use their recordings from then and, and talk to them. Uh, and it... It was a 30-minute documentary, yeah. which I'm told today is, is uh, 
insane because radio stations, public radio stations, don't have 30 minute blocks. They have hour, mm -hmm. uh, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but we went ahead and did it and had a great time doing it. Uh, we were both kind of history buffs, and it, it turned out, I, I listened to it a couple of years ago again. This was because we did this in 98. Yeah. Right? And uh, I listened to it a couple of uh, years ago. I thought, this really did turn out all right. You know, there are a lot of times you'll go back and listen to something yes. and you're going, oh my God, what yeah. was I thinking? This yep. is horrible. But um, yeah, there's some things that work out right. Yeah, so Dewey ran twice, right? Once against FDR, right. once, against once against FDR, once against Truman. Truman, yeah. and so this is the story about Dewey versus Truman. Mm -hmm. Okay, specifically. You also mentioned Dewey and Shears. Um, that was in some of the history because he had a role in... Right, he was the New York uh, State's attorney, yeah. and uh, uh, and and I think at one point a federal prosecutor. Mm -hmm. But he was, you know, if any movie that you've seen about gangsters uh, and, and booze, right, was probably modeled on some story that he had a part to do deal with. Mm -hmm. um, he was um, he was a very, by all accounts, a really great guy, a pretty policy, uh, pretty good policy wonk. Uh, uh, certainly brave because yeah. he's taking on the gangs of the prohibition period, right? Right. Uh, but he just kind of, uh, as he told Nixon on the golf course in Florida at some point, I peaked too early. <laughs> he was too young. Yeah. And uh, and he was a very monotone, not very exciting candidate. Sure. Uh, Wouldn't and, fly today. Yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. Hmm. But he, he would have been he would have been a really a really good president. Good president. I didn't know he's from Owasso. That yep. is also fascinating. I think. So you mentioned uh, thirty minute segments. You mentioned you're trying to produce a twelve minute segment. You mentioned uh, sometimes you get three or four minutes out of it, and you have twelve second blurbs. I think is what you said, not twelve minute. With over time, you started in uh, what year? Uh, nineteen eighty five. Nineteen eighty five. You started your career in 1985. Appetites of news have changed since then. How has that affected journalism as a whole? Are you able to do deep dives? How do you convey your information? Do you have the same responsibility to tell the same stories? Well, in 1985 uh, through uh, 94, I was working in commercial. Okay. Uh, and so uh, it was very different than yeah. public radio. Tell me a little bit about commercial, like dig into that a little bit. There aren't that many commercial radio stations who are doing news gotcha. these days. Yeah. Back then, almost every station did because there was a doctrine that said that the public service demands yeah. by the FCC were a lot more stringent. Yeah. Those were loosened later. Okay. And when they did, uh, everybody said, oh, well, let's get rid of the news uh, room. That's a quick buck we can make. And mm. they did. Mm. Uh, like newspapers are losing people now. Yep. Radio went through that a long time ago. Okay. And so um, I got asked to start working at a public radio station, and, and that's when I realized just how different it was mm. because I'm used to writing 40-second stories for right. a newscast. Right. Uh, I did have uh, a show each weekend that mm -hmm. I had to produce in addition to my six-day week. Sure. Uh, that was public service, and I took it really seriously and yeah. did it fully fully blown, fully produced stuff. I mean, I was 22. I was, you know, right. trying to make a name for myself. Going at it. And um, so when I got to public radio and they said, go cover uh, this at City Hall. Yep. And they said, we want a feature out of it. I'm like, how, how long is that? And four minutes and 30 seconds. There you go. And I'm thinking, four minutes and 30 seconds? Yeah. I know how to write 40-second stories. Okay. And now, uh, recently, since I started helping them out with the COVID-19, I've gone from writing those 40, 430 features almost exclusively right. to suddenly writing 50-second stories. Back to 50 seconds. <laughs> it's, like, it's amazing. But the, the, the transition in, in the news business, it, it depends. Okay. Uh, the, the, uh, the WBBMs of Chicago yep. and w, uh, 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 WCBS in New York yep. and WWJ in Detroit, they're doing really good, uh, solid coverage news. It's a little faster paced sure. uh, than it used to be, mm -hmm. uh, but they're doing, they're doing good news. The problem is with that, give us 20 minutes, we'll give you the world type format, yep. you're never going to get anything very in-depth. Right. And um, 
I kind of got to a point where I felt like I was cheating my listeners mm. because they needed more context to understand that than 40 seconds would allow. Yep. So I felt like I wasn't giving them the context they needed with a 40 second piece. Right. Uh, I felt like I was, you know, I could do better. And sure. when public radio came along, it gave me the opportunity. Uh, I thought, oh, wow, okay. Uh, now that first four minute and 30 second feature was a challenge because yeah. I wasn't used to writing that long. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but those skills actually have helped me because I've been able to write concisely. Right. You know? I can get to a point quickly. Yep. Even if I want to go 12 minutes and I only have 4.30. Sure. <laughs> so I've got the opposite problem now. Right. But. How, do you receive direct feedback from the public on your stories? Um, yeah, I mean, because of social media, right? Sure. Uh, and, you know, I am I am more fortunate than some. Um, I have colleagues in print who get horrible mm -hmm. uh, comments and mail, emails and stuff like that. Uh, I occasionally get, uh, you know, a, a, a barb here and there. Sure. Uh, it's funny, you know, uh, public radio is supposed to be so liberal, and I get many more complaints from uh, the left really? than I do from the right. Interesting. Uh, but I do get... I get a fair amount from both sides. Do you, um, does that mean you're doing your job if you're getting it from both sides? You know, I think that's an easy answer, yeah. um, and I don't like that that response. Sure. A lot of my friends use that response. Okay. Unless we're doing something right, everybody's. Yeah. yeah. How do you shape it? I I I don't have a very thick skin, uh, so when somebody criticizes me, I'm thinking, are they right? Mm. And. I'll start looking at it, and then I'll ask other people, hey, look, look at this. this. This person had this to say about this. Do you think? So I'll take it to more than one of my editors yeah. and ask them, and then I'll take it to somebody who's not in the business right. and ask them, do you think this person has a point? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's, you know, and, and, and at one point, the state of Michigan, um, under the... Uh, uh, the Snyder administration, mm -hmm. the health department, MDHHS, uh, sent a three-page single-space thing trashing uh, a series that I did mm. uh, in, the, in really angry terms. Mm. And so we had to take that seriously, right? So we actually hired independent editors from other states wow. to go over the complaints, the three pages of complaints, go mm -hmm. over my work for yep. that week. Yep. And come up with a, a fair and accurate assessment of whether I did the things that this this person said I did yeah. uh, or not. And so we take that stuff really seriously. As it turns out, um, they felt like the comments were talking about things I didn't even report on. Mm. They were just angry. They were just angry. And so, uh, but that he was a former senator. Yeah, uh, I barely knew him. But when he got to be a, a, in a place at the MDHHS, he, he just was uh, like a fish out of water. He was like, I think I think it's important to note that having complaints or having barbs come in from both sides is not a bellwether for high quality journalism. Um, and I think I'm glad I'm, I'm glad you pushed back on that because it feels like you said it's kind of easy to say, right? It's an easy response, but that doesn't mean what you reported on was accurate by any means. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Journalism counts. I want to repeat that once more. Journalism counts. Partisan news is readily available anywhere and everywhere. No matter your point of view, you're likely to find supporting evidence with just a few clicks. Even if it's wrong, even if it's a lie. Be skeptical, but avoid being cynical. Gather data, but prioritize well-researched evidence. Be curious and dig deeply. Reading a headline is not enough. Read the article, then read the sources cited. Most importantly, work hard to know when someone is working to skew your opinion simply to get their way.
do you feel, has your access to the public increased with the increase of social media? Like, do you get more commentary on your Oh yeah, yeah, now? quite a bit. Uh, okay. You know, the days of the, uh, the letters are, are fewer and fewer. Usually if we get a letter now, yeah. um, uh, as my newspaper said, you know, every time you get a letter, the editors think that it's a flood of letter. <laughs> <laughs> a flood of letter, yeah. Uh, but um, usually it's for, it's thanking us. Yeah. Uh, really appreciative. Yeah. Um, uh, when we do get comments, uh, you know, we've got, uh, we stopped taking comments on, on our stories online. Yep. Because it was just too much trouble to yep. monitor that stuff and, and, yeah. and because people will always cross the line. So, yeah. Uh, so we still have Facebook, um, those comments. And, you know, after you watch that for a while, you realize, oh, okay, we've got four trolls here. Yep. And they're always there. Yep. And they're not looking for answers. They're just looking to... Um, Insight. Yeah, exactly. And and so you still look, and, th and but usually it's not even about the story. Yeah. I had the opportunity when we were at the Environment Report, um, because it was a national show, to do some focus groups. Mm. So we're sitting on the opposite side of the yeah. one-way mirror, and the guy's in there, and they're talking about different kinds of stuff and bringing up our pieces here and there to listen to. Yeah. That was the best feedback I had ever seen. Mm. Uh, I'll give you one small example. Yeah, um, please. One of, my, one of my colleagues did a story about um, it's not always a good idea to remove a dam on a river sure. because it'll stir up all the old sediment and resuspend the pollutants in there. Mm. And it was just a spot, right? It's 40 seconds long, 50 seconds long. And the moderator said, so what do you think of that story? And it was dead quiet for like, it seemed like an eternity. Hmm. It was probably 20 seconds. Finally, one brave woman said, I don't understand this story. Tear out dams? Why would you tear out dams? We're Americans. We build dams. And we thought, oh my God, she's completely right. Because we right. assumed too much knowledge. We yeah. assumed everybody knew that there was this effort to remove dams sure. to allow free and flowing rivers. Yeah. And just took it for granted that everybody was on board with that. So we uh, changed gears a big. That was an epiphanous moment for us. We started looking at our stuff saying, okay, is everybody going to understand this story? Right. We can't pretend like everybody knows this issue. Right. So what are we going to do to make sure that we have enough context in there, they get it? Hmm. It, was, it was a really good moment for us uh, because it was, it was one of those moments where you're going, wow. Here we thought we were enlightening everybody, right? And they don't even know what we're talking about. Hmm. Is that a case of being too far ahead of common knowledge? I guess. Yeah, I, well, it? it happens on a lot of beats. Yeah. You know, if you're on the cop beat, you're using all the cop jargon in your copy all the time. Yep. You know, apprehended the suspect. Sure. Yeah. You know, it's not. It's not. And if you're doing the fire beat, mm -hmm. you know, uh, house. Uh, 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 the blaze, yeah. you know, you never use blaze in, in, a, <laughs> in a sentence. So everybody does that stuff, uh, especially at a beat. Yep. Uh, the hospital or the healthcare person is doing it, and yeah. um, you know, so you have to you have to always be aware of it. Uh, what's worse is having a general assignment reporter who doesn't understand it at all and thinks they're using the proper language oh. and they're not at all. Right, that's, that's bad. Um, do you, do you then, before you go out and do some reporting, or at least at, in your creation of the news, do you have to consider your target audience? Is that really a part of Yeah, your well, writing? yes and no. I mean, um, our, our audience generally, uh, especially 15 years ago, was older, mm -hmm. uh, like my age. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we decided a long time ago, look, we cannot... Uh, just speak their language. We've yeah. got to speak the language of younger people too. And, yeah. uh, and that naturally happened because we started hiring younger reporters. Sure. Uh, now I hear things in the air I'm going, I'm not sure I know what that means. You know? <laughs> but, That's you know, uh, but uh, yeah, it, the target audience, it, 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 it varies. It, it's a moving target. Yeah, interesting. Uh, and, and it's younger now. Yeah. Partly because of shows like This American Life. Yep. And, uh, you know, well, we've got a number of them on the weekend yeah. that appeal to younger people and people of color, which is 
thank God, because yeah. the, you know, public radio audience is like the whitest audience ever. <laughs> Well, you have shows like, is it 1A? Is that right? 1A, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that it seems to attract a more diverse audience, at least among my friends. Yeah, it, it, well, absolutely. And in fact, a former colleague of mine at Michigan Radio yes. is the new 1A host. She okay. starts in July. Oh. I'm very thrilled with her. Her name yeah. is Jen White. Okay, yeah. Uh, and so uh, she went to Chicago for a while. Yep. And, uh, you know, she's beloved by everybody at Michigan Radio. And that's so awesome. when we heard the news that she was going to be the new hosts were like, oh man, that's perfect. This She'll do such a great job. I, I'm not sure you're aware of this um, trope or, or uh, w those of us who listen to NPR and talk about NPR yeah. always comment on the names of the hosts. Oh yeah. <laughs> Are you guys aware of that? Oh like yeah. Lester Graham and Cynthia Canty and all these different names, Gen White. Like we just, they seem to be a little more unique names than the common names in society. Right, especially especially in NPR. Yeah, especially uh, in they've NPR, got, uh, you yeah. know. Uh, there's so many of them. Uh, so I, I think that's great, you know, obviously. <laughs> I just wondered if you were aware of it. Just oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Like, Actually, there, there, there are stand-up comedians who talk about okay. that and okay. things like that. Yeah, it's, 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 it's widely known, and, and, you know, we embrace it. Good. You know, it, might be, it might be funny and sound different than other places, and we're going, that's okay with us. <laughs> that that like works. That. that feels like you're interacting with the community yeah. at that point. Yeah. One of the, we, we talked about sort of the construction of a media piece uh, and I think it's important, and, and inter interacting with people and hearing feedback and those sorts of things. But now we're also in an era where news occurs outside of the news. Um, you know, people share Facebook posts of things they witnessed. Uh, they tweet uh, and they do a live video of something that's happening in that moment. Uh, there's news happening outside the news all the time. And then you have this secondary wave of memes and things that are associated with the news, and those become ultra pervasive. For a while there, a lot of news operations were doing live Facebook things. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's just a different platform. Yeah. It's all about content. Sure. What's your, you know, what are you, what are you bringing me? Mm -hmm. And is, can I trust it? Right. So it doesn't matter whether it's Facebook Live or actually a paper you can hold in your hand or on the radio or just online? Because we do a lot of stuff that's exclusively for online, especially a lot of the data reporting. Does it matter who's doing it? Because if platform doesn't matter, if you guys exist on all the platforms, does who's telling the story matter? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of, there are a lot of organizations that consider themselves uh, in the news business, even though they're an advocacy group. Mm. And that... Um, you know, it, I, I will dispute that characterization. Yeah. You're still an advocacy group. Yep. Uh, just because you're pretending to be a news operation. And, and that's, you know, that's where we're at now. Uh, there, was a, there was a time when uh, legislators were talking about licensing journalists, which mm. is, you know, a complete violation of the First Amendment of the Constitution. Right. Uh, so it's ridiculous. But at the same time, you wish you could... Um, somehow signify who's actually a journalist and who's not. Right. And here's how you do it. Right. You set yourself apart by telling the truth objectively all the time. Mm. And if you make a mistake, you correct it publicly and loudly. Mm. You know, uh, I made a mistake uh, on a, a on a spot, just a spot, uh, and I went on. Um, stateside mm -hmm. and said yeah there's been a lot of confusion about that and mm -hmm. i have been part of adding to the confusion mm. i really apologize for that so here's what's really happening there's an ethics and humility innate in the situation you just described yeah i i don't even think it takes humility it just takes human decency you don't want to mislead people right yeah i mean yes i made a mistake it, it, it's not going to be the last one either Thankfully, through most of my career, there have not been a lot of them. Right. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't still be working. But when I make one, I want to make sure I actually asked to be on stateside so I can make that correction. Mm, I know? think that's important. Uh, and and they were you know more than willing to let me do that because they wanted to clear up the record. Sure. I had the latest info. I knew exactly what was going on. Sure. Uh, in the rush to put the spot on, right. I got something wrong. Right. Uh, and that's why I hate doing newscasts. I, I, I'd much rather do the long form stuff where I can make sure that I can double check and check. double check. Yeah. You know? But anyway, yes. Uh, so not everybody does that, right? The, there are these others. They, they have 
not just a perspective, but an agenda. Right. And there's no agenda at Michigan Radio. We do have a point of view of the world. Sure. Uh, and that's going to differ from maybe CBS yep. or the Wall Street Journal. Yep. Um, and it's not, we don't have an objective or an agenda, though. Right. We're not trying to convince you. Right. It's in what we cover. We might cover a lot more stuff about gay rights. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I spent a whole year doing nothing but covering uh, LGBT mm -hmm. issues. And, uh, and not every newsroom would do that. Right. But we felt like it was an undercovered issue that needed to be covered more closely. It just happened to be, coincidentally, the year that um, uh, gay marriage was made legal. Right. But, you know, it's not how we cover it. Right. It's in what we cover sometimes. Yep. Because if it's an issue you don't like, you don't want to hear about it. Right. But if it's an issue that's in, 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 before the public, we're going to tell you about it. Yeah. So you might choose to emphasize a particular type of story because of the perspective you have at, you know, in your station overall. But you're still telling it in such a way where people can decide what they think about it at the end of the yeah, we're not. We game. don't want to tell anybody what to think. Yeah. We just want to have some information so they can make their own decisions. Yeah. And, and you know, if you don't cover some things because they're too controversial, um, you're really not a very good newsroom. I mean, Edward R. Murrow, when he was uh, doing documentaries, yeah. he did stuff on migrant farming before anybody was thinking about migrant farming and how those folks were being treated. Right. And it was, it, it, it changed things. He, you know, he took on uh, 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 McCarthy. Right. And, you know, that documentary change things that revealed this guy's not telling you to the truth all the time right and so um you've got to tackle some issues that aren't popular and may not be on the radar for other people that doesn't mean you're biased right it just means your point of view is a little broader than maybe the general public would like sure and i think in that case there's an importance to the story that the general public isn't aware Hmm. Speaking of Murrow, you gave me this segue. <laughs> <laughs> um, you've won a couple of Murrow rewards at the national level, and I want to know what pieces those were for, um, or what p parts of your work those were for. Um, okay. Five Murrows. Five Murrows. Um, and hopefully six this year, because uh, we won the regionals this year, so yeah. that's good. Fingers crossed. Uh, the first one was, it was really funny. The report, I was an editor on yeah. this one. I was not the reporter. The reporter was decided with this brilliant idea to mic an LPGA player and her caddy. Right. So we could hear that conversation that nobody gets to hear. Yeah. And he went out, we bought, you know, we rented some equipment for him to use so he could do all this. Yeah. Uh, this was 96, so, you know, it wasn't that easy then. It, yeah, sure. It was easy. And he came back and he's furious to the point he kicked a chair across the room because he lost a whole bunch of his tape and i'm like okay what do you got left yeah it doesn't matter the best stuff was there I'm like people aren't going to know what the best stuff is sure. let's see if you've got something here so i went in with him and i sat down I'm like that's good you could use that that's really good. That's great. This is fantastic stuff. The other stuff was so much better. <laughs> so I, I persuaded him to, to actually do the piece because he was going to trash it. Yeah. And he did. And he won the Edward R. Murrow for sports reporting. Wow. Which, uh, this was in St. Louis, Missouri. Yeah. Uh, KMOX, the CB owned, a CBS owned and operated affiliate, yep. which called itself the Sports Voice of America, had never won a sports Murrow. And so they were wow. not very happy that the little public radio station won a, a, a mural for sports coverage. In That's their impressive. Town. Uh, the second one, um, let's see, that was uh, for GLRC, the Great Lakes Radio Consortium. Okay. It was about the use of sound. It was about the uh, mallard ducks and the rate of decline. Of, yeah. Uh, the decline in the rate of, of reproduction. Okay. And I traveled around with these biologists all day long and, yeah. you know, crawled on my belly to get close to a, a duck and her ducklings. And, yeah. Uh, you know, it was just filled with a lot of good sound. Yeah. And uh, so it won for best sound. Uh, the third one, I only had a minor part to deal with. It was, uh, I was, I, I helped edit a, a piece that was a, a huge Michigan radio effort. Okay. And, uh, it was about, uh, schools. Yep. I had a very small role in that. Yeah. Uh, but you know, Hey, I was part of the team. You were part of the team. Uh, 
the next one was uh, the reporter was Sean Ali. Okay. Uh, doing something that I assigned him to, and that was to find out what is the situation with dioxin oh, in the Titabawasi River. That's huge, yeah. It was huge at the time, yeah. and he did such a wonderful job, and we had to restructure his series yeah. uh, because he had this piece of tape yep. from a former EPA Region 5 administrator mm -hmm. who became uh, 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 Estonia's first president after the wall fell. Okay. Because he was... No, yeah. Maybe it's Lithuania. Anyway, one of those three yes. countries together. And he was back visiting, just happened to be visiting, and uh, uh, Sean got the interview with him and was asking him about the dioxin thing. Yeah. And he said, I cannot believe 40 years later that they still haven't made any progress on this. <laughs> and it's because the, both the state and Dow have not cooperated the way they should. Wow. And, you know, that blew it up. That was yeah, a statement. Yeah. So, yeah, that was a number one. And then um, Rebecca, Mark, and I mm -hmm. um, did a piece called uh, uh, Coal, uh, Dirty Past, Hazy Future. Okay. It was a documentary. Yep. We won for a documentary. And uh, that was our last piece for the Environment Report as a national show. No kidding. That's so two, amazing. So two of those, those last two, yeah. were not large market right they were network they were against npr and yeah. cbs yeah. and nbc yeah the others were for, at large market stations right like chicago new york la and so, so forth huh so the the two that we won for network coverage i'm, I'm really really very proud of so. yeah absolutely um did do you think in retrospect looking at those two the uh dioxin uh award you, you know i'm Please jump in. I got to correct because it was actually it was the duck one and the Titapawasi story. Those were the those were the network ones. Those were the and network. Coal was a large market one. Coal was because large market. Environment Report was done by that point. Okay, so we gotcha. Did it, we did it for Michigan. Radio. Well, what was your angle on that particular coal story? Uh, we wanted to know everything about it. Yeah. Um, we wanted to find out what are, what is the potential for CO2 sequestration. Yep. Uh, because that was a big study at the time yep. going on, we, and an actual pilot test. We wanted to find out about that. We wanted to find out how important coal was to the economy. Yep. We wanted to find out about, you know, are, why are they getting subsidies? Yeah. And there's such a fight about subsidies for renewable energy. Right. Uh, I went to a coal mine. Yep. Uh, we talked to West Virginia miners. That's what I was wondering. Uh, we talked to um, uh, uh, we talked to a lot of experts and a lot of real people yeah. about what's going on. Uh, at the time, there was the campaign of clean coal that yes. had been recently introduced, yep. and we're like, we explored what does clean coal mean? Why do you call it clean coal? Sure. Um, and and we had you know basically 52 minutes to explore that issue. Yeah. Uh, one of the things we did, which I, I thought was fun, is we went to uh, Greenfield Village. Yep. And I got to sit uh, in Edison's lab to talk about when electricity really started becoming in demand. That's a joy. And got to, and it was winter that was closed. Yeah. You know, they're closed. But they let me go in there and, and do that little setup yeah. in Edison's lab, which I thought was fun. That's now it's radio. Nobody right. knows, right? You right. have to you tell them. That experience. You have to tell them and they have to believe you, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm here sitting in Edison's lab. And it's lab. exactly, you know. Yeah. But. Are there other experiences like that in your radio career thus far that you cherish that were just, mm -hmm. or, or just, you're happy you did? There's so many of them where you get access to events or places or people that you just never would ever otherwise. Right. Just never come I mean, across. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Yeah. I mean, uh, U.S. presidents that you get to talk to, mm. you know, I spent um, half a day following Ronald Reagan around after his presidency because I was working in northern Illinois. Right. And he's from Dixon, Illinois. Right. And he, right. this was his last visit to his hometown. And, you know, there you are standing next to Ronald Reagan, um, you know, and at the time I was a young reporter and yeah. he had been president for eight years. Yeah. And it was a really, really, really big deal. Um, uh, since then, interviewing presidents has, it's always still exciting. Yeah, of that course. was That was different because it was a surprise yeah. visit, you know, or yeah. totally a surprise. But, sure. Uh, anyway, generally it's been the people you meet 
I mean, there are those moments where you get to see things that nobody else gets to see. Mm -hmm. um, but it's about the people. I mean, when you're talking about the thousands and thousands of interviews I've done, right? You know, some of those I will never forget because they were just so fascinating. Like the woman who decided to do this one woman crusade to save every uh, uh, waterfowl, bird, duck, whatever, right. uh, in, in Lake, uh, along Lake Erie that she found that was injured. Yeah. And she bought, uh, an old house in a bad neighborhood and turned it into one big bird sanctuary. The stench of that place was amazing, but right. she was so passionate and hmm. just couldn't imagine why anybody would, you know, not, not, not be doing this and, and helping right. and, and things like that. So, you know, it's stuff like that. I, I got into an argument with a Nobel Peace Prize winner. Um, <laughs> that was that was interesting. I won't tell you who. Okay. Uh, but it was fun. And it wasn't Henry Kissinger. All right. <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, uh, I, I, I just, I just, I came in with a, a, a certain assumptions about this Nobel Prize winner yep. and what his positions might be. Yeah. And I was completely wrong. Okay. Uh, and, and so he really got aggravated with me about asking some of these questions. Do you feel like you got the story? Do, do you feel like? Oh yeah. It was, yeah. And in fact, it was very enlightening. Yeah. You know, um, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you who it is. All right. So, and we're talking about the Nobel Peace Prize. Yes. Uh, his name is Norman Borlaug. Okay. He's considered the father of the Green Revolution, which yep. is not what we think of today. And okay. He uh, invented a, a type of wheat yep. that could be grown in really arid areas. So he made it possible for uh, areas that had no kind of crop at all to be able to grow wheat uh, in many, many parts of He saved millions of people from starving. Yeah. Right? So I thought, father of the Green Revolution, he's probably got some problems with GMOs or right. pesticides or... Right. Mm, Something. No. No. <laughs> anything to produce more food yeah. was okay with him. Interesting. So he was aligned with the outcome. Yeah. Not yeah. the process. Yeah. Yeah. And he had, you know, he had the credit to do that. And, he, and again, he didn't win it for some kind of science prize or something. It was the Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah, that's which incredible. Is, which is really, really big deal, especially yeah. for a scientist to get. Yeah, that is incredible. Do you, do you find that, so, so you've met some people who are extraordinarily well-known, and you've met a lot of people who are your average citizen that you'd run into every single day. Do you feel... Do you feel similarity between you know these two types of people, or if you? Yeah, it's passion. Yeah, uh, it's always passion. Mm. Um, you know, every story comes down to this. Yeah, find somebody who's doing something and find out why. Mm -hmm. And when you find somebody who's making a difference, mm -hmm. one person making a difference, that's a grand story. Mm. There's a kid named Chad Pogrecker, he's not a kid anymore, but he was uh, 21 and he decided he was going to start cleaning up the trash along the Mississippi and, and its tributaries. Yes. He called up the uh, Illinois DNR, Department of Natural Resources, and, and they're like, who are you, kid? What trash are you talking about? Mm. No, we don't have any help for you. Mm. So he went out and raised funds from... Uh, grants and from private sector companies mm -hmm. to, to start this effort to clean the, the Mississippi and its tributaries, right. uh, including the Illinois River and the Ohio River. And, uh, and once they had finished that job, and they did, pulling tractors and washers and cars and wow. all kinds of styrofoam out of the rivers and disposing of them properly, then they went on to start uh, planting trees mm. in areas that were prone to wash and, and increased flooding mm -hmm. along these rivers. Mm. And the, the guy is one person who just said, yeah. I see a problem, I'm going to fix it. Yeah. Those people are out there all the time, yeah. and, and we just don't always find them to be able to tell their story. But yeah. when you do, it's a great experience. We talked earlier about um, deep dives into particular stories or shedding the light on something that people don't know about, and that you've leaned on that spectrum, if we say that's the spectrum, towards shedding the light on things people don't know about. And that is a perfect illustrative for, that, for what we talked about earlier. Yeah. You know, that, that whole thing comes down to, if you find yourself asking, why is that happening? Mm. Go find out. Go find out.
So something, I came in through this conversation, I realized I might have made an error in some of my notes. And I came in with this assumption that we are, gonna, that we are in an age of disinformation. And we are going to come in and, and I was going to ask you a question and say, we're in an age of di disinformation. What do you think? And then as we've talked, I've kind of thought to myself, are we in an age of disinformation in terms of uh, news and media? Because everything you've said so far makes me think, it's all out there. Um, the signal to noise ratio just has changed over the years. Um, well, it comes down, I mean, there is please. disinformation yeah. uh, out there. And, and if, it, if, it, if that meme that you just saw yeah. resonates with you and your own personal feelings about something, right. you don't care whether it's right or wrong or right. correct. You're yeah. just going to repost it because it's exactly what you think. Um, uh, I and some of my other colleagues used to, friends, yeah. real friends, yeah. people we know, yeah. they would post something that was inaccurate. And they would say, I, I don't care right. because it says what I think. Right. And, and that's where we're at right now. I don't care whether it's factual. Does it resonate with what I think? Reinforce. Yep. And you get in that echo chamber. Yep. And there you are. I, th I think, you know, I love being challenged. Mm -hmm. uh, and somebody showing me, because now I get a chance to learn something, right? Right. You know, my preconceived notions about something are disrupted. I get more information. I have larger context yep. that makes me a more knowledgeable person. I love that process. Yeah. Most people don't. Yeah. It's a hard process. They, they you know, a lot of them, by 20, I know what I know. Yeah. And you're not going to change me beyond this. I've already got my set of principles instilled in myself. Right. This is what I believe. Yep. And it's got to be, you know... Well, you might just get me to move off of that position. Yeah. And that's generally how most people are. And some of us are hardwired to be one way or another. You sure. Know, hardwired to think of fairness uh, or think of loyalty. Right. So you said you're, in a way, you said you're a perennial learner. Um, you appreciate being challenged. But I think there's also some things that you've said previously that reinforce that. Um, your argument with the Nobel Peace Prize uh, winner that you had talked about. And then when we talked earlier about um, listening to feedback, you said, um, you, you know, your words were, I have thin skin um, and I interpret feedback this way, is, you know, to paraphrase the, paraphrase the rest of that. But those are exactly in line with what you just said about being a learner. Well, um, just for the record, I never finished college. Yeah, sure. And I felt like learning on the news beat. Yeah. I won't say it made up for it, but it really gave me an opportunity to go to class every day. Yeah. Uh, because there's rarely a day goes by covering news that I don't learn something. Yeah. And understand the intricacies of the world just a little more. Yeah. Uh, Do you find the people who appreciate your your track record, right? The, the environment report or the work you've done as a reporter after the environment report, that they are learners, that they kind of fit that mold somehow? You know, I, I, they're at the very least curious. Yeah, sure. Curious people. I mean, that's one thing that we know uh, just through research. One thing that we know about public radio listeners, they're mm. curious. Mm. And uh, if you're curious, I mean, are you ever going to learn enough? Yeah, right? that's true. What about for the people who aren't learners and they just want the news, right? They just want, give me a sound bite, give me something to believe in and I'm moving forward. Oh, that's my wife. <laughs> okay. No, seriously. Yeah. I mean, she does not want to go into all the context and depth and everything else. She just wants to know what's happening. Yeah. Is that a bulk of people who have taken news? I think so. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I live the stuff day in and day out. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people, especially right now, yeah. uh, with all the news about COVID-19 mm -hmm. uh, and um, some, some politics, some people are really upset about politics right now, Yeah, uh, I, they really get to the point where they want to shut down. Yeah. I've had enough. Yeah. I, need, I don't need any more bad news. Hey, friends, post some cute puppy pictures for me. Yeah. You know, I, I want to take my mind off this for a while. Yeah. And I rarely get like that. Mm. Uh, I, sometimes I have to just shut down. That's why. That's what they made the UP for. That's what God <laughs> made the UP. And Lake Superior. Yeah. And Isle Royale, if you really yeah, want to get yeah. out there. So I, I think that people, 
People want to know enough to know, have a pretty good handle on what's happening and how it might affect their lives. Yep. But they don't want to know at all. They don't need they to don't know. They don't need every Washington, D.C. scandal or so-called scandal. Yeah. Uh, they just don't need it all. Let's talk about truth because I think it's an extension of, of what we're currently talking about. You mentioned earlier that truth is a differentiator. You know, there's, if you're going to describe someone who is a news, you know, good at their job in news, it's about finding the truth. Um, tell us, I, I just want to know, like, has, has the concept of truth mor morphed over time? Is, is, should people seek to understand before they decide what the truth might be? Every time I hear this um, conversation, I think of the conversation between uh, Jesus and Pilate. <laughs> what is truth? Right, yeah. And um, so the debate's been going along uh, for a few millennia now. Longer than this conversation. And I, I guess, you know, you've got to decide for yourself um, whether facts that are verified, mm -hmm. even if you don't like what those are right is truth or whether you want your truth to be something that only agrees with what you believe whether or not you shrink your world right yeah well yeah i, I agreed with that a little too quickly but yeah you're right in some ways right if you're going to be avoidant that's the result so it's about your what your job is uh or at least what you seek to do is constant verifiable fact, uh, uninterpreted, but presented logically. Is that accurate? Right. Um, I, I will say that, you know, I think in some stories, and some of my colleagues would disagree with this, some stories you need some analysis because, mm. you know. Extension. Um, and this is something that's been happening uh, recently because we've always like, he said, she said, story done. Yeah. But if he said, or she said something that is uh, verifiably an untruth. Right. Th that apple can't can be compared to this orange. Sure. You know, you cannot do that. We can't get away with that kind of lazy kind of journalism. Right. You've got to get some an 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 and an analysis can be as simple as saying that statement has been. Uh, found to be a hoax or yeah. disproven or, yep. um, uh, you know, is, is not valid. Right. Some has somehow explained to your audience, this is what they say, Yeah. but we know that this is not true. Right. And, and here's how we know this is not true. So it's not just, it's not analysis in terms of opinion or right. opining on whatever the topic was. It's actually analysis in terms of we went and did more research and this is the result. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Got it. I like that. I feel like um, th this is personal and this is anecdote, but I feel like among my friends, especially the NPR listeners, they feel like they can, they feel like they know where to go to get truthful news and they feel like they know where not to go if they want opinion and conjecture and analysis. But all of us tend to believe those things have gotten closer together yeah. and a little more blurred over time. Yeah. Is that the feeling from a person in the industry? Yeah, um, you know, uh, a lot of people complain about Fox News, uh, but I see MSNBC as just the same thing. Different uh, direction. It's just in a different political direction. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, and we've, in, in, during the Flint crisis, MSNBC was literally borrowing without permission stuff from our station wow and we called them on it yeah and they 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 confessed and admitted uh and then had our you know one of our reporters on to to talk about the story yeah but you know it's so frustrating to watch that my mother mm -hmm. watches msnbc news and i'm mm -hmm. like mom they're, they're more objective and but she likes what she hears yeah it's, it's comforting <sighs> and you know i've got an uncle who who Swears by Fox TV. It's yep. the only they're they're the only ones telling the real story. Yeah, and so I don't know what you do about that. I know what my that, choice that is. Going to be my next question. Yeah, I know what my choice is, and, yeah. and what we're trying, what we're striving to do at, at, at NPR and, and public radio is to give you enough information to make up your own mind. Yeah, we're not trying to persuade you. Yep, we just want you to figure out what's out there. 
and uh, we'll give you the context you need to, and enough information that if you decide you want to look into it further, right, you can. You know where to go. Yep. I think that's a great place to. I, I think leave people. You know that. Go find your information that you trust from sources that use verifiable news. And <laughs> uh, can I add one more thing, please? When somebody says, "I only listen to NPR," I immediately say, "Why?" Sources. Yeah, right? it's, it's you plural. should have. You cannot rely on any one news source. Yeah. You, you should not. Should not. If you want to be a well-rounded American citizen, you need to get your sources of news from more than one place. Completely agree. Thank you. Thank you. You are a remarkable person. I really appreciate you doing this. I appreciate being here. give you i only mention your murrows like five or se to seven times in the intro I <laughs> well you've that's, been up very, to, that's up to you <laughs> you've been very humble about it and and i i think i think that sort of recognition is important um because it does say everything that we idealize in the media you accomplish and fulfill and i think that should happen but there are a lot of them in michigan who have yeah yeah, yeah it's not yeah thank you Thank you.